The intent of this video is to address how Combat Effective was attacking flak battery sites and mitigating the flak risk to the main bomber strike force. We will look at flak suppression tactics, weapons, and a case study where B-24s were sent to destroy flak battery sites. As discussed in previous channel's videos, the main bomber threat shifted from fighters to flak in June 1944, the month of D-Day. This trend is not so much that the combat effectiveness of German flak increased, rather the threat from fighters decreased during the first part of 1944. The Germans were pouring massive amounts of resources into defensive anti-aircraft flak batteries, as discussed on this page from a declassified April 1945, 9th Air Force document titled Outline Plan Eclipse. A large percentage of personnel are manning the homeland anti-aircraft guns. It is estimated that 1,105,000 persons are needed to operate the 16,000 heavy and 50,000 light guns. As the Allies pushed their way towards Germany, flak guns were relocated to protect war-critical target areas. As seen on this map outlining the locations of heavy flak in September 1943, and February 1945 from an October 1945 Army Air Forces Evaluation Board document titled Tactical Development. This chart shows a flak battery's integrated air defense system components, the guns, fire control director, auxiliary equipment, and radar. An 11-gun flak gross battery is shown on this image from a 1945 U.S. 8th Air Force document titled Flak, Light, Intense, and Accurate. The two main principles of flak evasion are listed on this page from a 1945 SINPAC flak intelligence memorandum. Minimize exposure to flak and make the flak gunner's job as difficult as possible. The tactics bombers can adopt to meet these goals are listed on this page from a 1945 ADI report titled German Flak. Item B lists attacking flak positions just prior to bombing the target. 70 to 90 percent of flak damage occurs over the target area, as discussed on this page from a December 1944 Air Defense Division document titled Air Defense Review, Issue 5. This implies flak suppression should be focused on the target area, not along the routes in or out. This map shows the January 18, 1945 non-direct routes the bombers would take to avoid the flak positions. This page outlines flak battery attack tactics from a 1945 document titled Report on the Combat Operations of the 19th Tactical Air Command. Neutralize the most threatening gun positions. Attack flak positions with fragmentation bombs, white phosphorus bombs, or strafing. If the attacking frontline flak positions are within range, consider coordinating with U.S. counter-battery artillery. This page from a May 1945 Assistant Chief of Air Staff report titled U.S. Tactical Air Power in Europe outlines a coordinated U.S. artillery attack on German flak positions. As the 9th Air Force medium bombers entered hostile territory, the U.S. artillery opened up on German flak positions. U.S. artillery range 12 miles. Restart suppressing fire during the bombers' return trip. This map identifies the flak positions around the German city of Munich as of March 10, 1945, from a 1945 AAF Evaluation Board document titled Flak Defenses of Strategic Targets in Southern Germany. Each symbol represents a flak battery at around 6 guns, and dual symbols are the larger flak gross batteries at 12 to 18 guns. Munich was protected by 196 88 mm, 28 105 mm, and 24 128 mm caliber guns. If the bombing target is located here, it might be best to route the bombers through this path by first suppressing these flak batteries circled. This page describes B-24 bombers flying flak suppression attacks on April 1st and 19th, 1945. From a June 1945 headquarters United States Strategic Air Forces in Europe document titled Minutes of Flak Conference, the 15th Air Forces attacked the Venice flak batteries at an altitude between 24 and 26,000 feet. The bombers attacked the batteries with 260-pound fragmentation bombs with variable time fuses. Variable time fuses are proximity fuses. The flak batteries were in the bomber corridor guarding the route to Germany and Austria. The flak battery attack was successful based on the reduction of flak fire. None of the 36 flak battery attacking B-24s were damaged. The attack killed 31 gunners, wounded 9, and destroyed a 20mm gun and other equipment. The proximity fuse 260-pound fragmentation bomb was selected to give these results reduce flak gun crew morale and gun accuracy, damage or destroy gun-sensitive fire control equipment, 
Each of the 36 B-24s carried 18 M-81 fragmentation bombs. The bombs were fused to detonate 17 feet above the ground. This page outlines characteristics and a cutaway of the M-81 260-pound fragmentation bomb from a 1947 Department of the Navy document titled U.S. Explosive Ordnance. The bomb's weight equates to 260 pounds and contains 34 pounds of an explosive fill. The bomb's casing consists of a 1-inch steel helical coil, which will fracture into thousands of fragments when detonated. Characteristics and a cutaway of the T-50E1 proximity fuse is shown on this page from a 1945 U.S. Navy bomb disposal document titled Bombs and Fuses Pyrotechnics. The fuse can be set to detonate the bomb's explosive fill at a distance from 10 to 40 feet from the ground. Expect only 80% of the fuses to function properly. This video describes the advantages of a proximity fused bomb. The simplest form of artillery or bomb fuses explode their carriers after impact with the target. But this method of detonation has been found to be ineffective when firing at enemy soldiers hidden in trenches. These targets could be engaged more effectively if the projectile would explode when it came close. The same system may be applied to targets on the ground. In this case, the earth acts as the reflector and the projectile is exploded in such a position that the spray of deadly fragments envelops the target. Due to security, general use of VT over land did not begin until December 1944, when field howitzers firing VT-fused shells were thrown into the now famous Battle of the Bulge. Allied air forces employed VT-fused bombs to silence enemy anti-aircraft guns during raids over northern Italy, Iwo Jima, and the Japanese home islands. This map shows the flak battery target locations from the April 1st and follow-up 19th raids. Bombing results were considered excellent. The flak battery stopped firing when the attacking formation's bombs detonated. Same results observed during the follow-up attack on the 19th. The strike formations following the flak suppression bombers navigated the corridor created two and a half hours after the flak battery suppression attack without encountering any flak bursts. The following conclusions can be drawn from these two case studies. High altitude bombers can saturate flak batteries with proximity fused M81 fragmentation bombs accurately enough and with sufficient density to suppress or eliminate the combat effectiveness of the battery. The proximity fused M81s reduced the flak gunner's morale, kit killed or injured the ground crew, and damaged anti-aircraft equipment. Bomber crews were enthusiastic in participating in these attacks as it afforded some payback. Additional observations of the attack are described on this page. Bomb fragment pattern overlapping was observed. This is considered wasteful. The intervalometer should be set to 100 feet, fly in loose formations, and assign only three planes to attack each flak battery. Other bombing mediums were considered. The advantage of attacking flak batteries with white phosphorus incendiary bombs is described. On impact, a phosphorus bomb showers the area 90 yards long by 60 yards wide. All personnel in the area will likely become burn casualties. The smoke produced obscures ground-to-air visibility, which reduces the flax effectiveness. Phosphorus bombs are effective over a greater length of time. Fragmentation bombs are effective during detonation. Phosphorus bomb detonations are effective for minutes. German crews put on their gas masks when under a phosphorus bomb attack. This reduced their combat effectiveness. Use chaff when attacking targets. Strike bomber crew's morale increased knowing flak batteries would be attacked. Many bomber crew members volunteered for anti-flak duty. They wanted to destroy the flak gun batteries. So, how effective was flak battery suppression? The benefits are listed on this page. The number of sorties required to destroy the primary target decreased and the number of flak losses dropped by half. The conference recommends a dedicated anti-flak combat bombing group be developed. The sole purpose of this group would be to destroy or damage flak batteries and neutralize by terror or disruption the batteries while the main formation flies over. In summary, flak suppression by attacking flak batteries with either proximity fuse fragmentation or white phosphorus bombs is effective and has been credited with reducing the trailing attacking bomber losses by half. Had the war continued, it is likely dedicated anti-flak heavy bomber groups would be leading each bomber mission, paving the way much like fighter escorts cleared the path for bombers from attacking interceptors. If you've enjoyed this flak suppression by bombing deep dive review, please consider engaging with the video by commenting, liking, and or subscribing to the channel World War II U.S. Bombers.